Greetings. Welcome to the Asna Kitchen Podcast. I'm David Garrig, and today's subject is four ways to clear your mind. And before I get started, I just want to uh, let you know I'm doing a, an online workshop entitled Capo Kids Unite. Okay, so it's a two-day workshop. Um, June 27th and 28th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the focus is on Kapotasana, the the formidable asana uh, backbend of the second series. Okay, so I will uh, teach you how to apply basic foundational backbending principles to that Kapotasana and also teach you how to kind of use the the postures in second series there's a series of back bends that lead up to kapotasana so we'll go through those one by one i'll teach you strategies for preparing for kapotasana and then there will also be a philosophy section that's kind of dealing with uh, the benefits and of working on postures that challenge you and that bring up dread and and, and aversion okay so uh you can find out about that on my website. Love to have you join me. You can take the class live or um, it will be recorded. So you can also tune into it on your own time for up to one week after it takes place. Okay, so anyway, here we go with this four ways to clear your mind or four attitudes to take. Okay, and so to set this up, the it, it, a lot of this material is coming from the Yoga Sutras, from uh, chapter one. In the middle of the chapter, there are sutras 130, 31, 32, 33, in, in that area. And so, first of all, they make this, uh, what is a clear state of mind? So, the, the word is chitta, is the field of the mind. And it's helpful to see your mind kind of like as a field and that thoughts are arising and passing. And so part of like how you determine whether your mind is clear is by um, assessing what's happening in the field of your mind at any given time. So this is a big part of the game that you're playing and that you're doing your practice for is to like um, be able to distinguish when you have a clear mind versus an unclear mind or a clouded mind. Okay, and so the word that they use for a clear mind is prasad. And I'm going to give you some little definitions of that. Uh, so you get the feeling for what does it mean to when your mind is clear? So it means um, serenity. There's a serenity there. And it's blessed, mercy, grace, uh, calmness, kindness, clearness, good humor, tranquility. Uh, it's a, a temple. So your kind of psychic reality is has a, a sacred feeling, like you're in touch with the awe and the mystery and the beauty of life. There's brightness or and clearness of style is also prasad. And simply well-being um, or seeing clearly or having ready understanding and insight into things. So, so there you go. This is a wonderful description of a clear mind. And it's also a synonym for this prasad, if you notice, uh, is buddhi. That's, so that's kind of the highest faculty of mind or the wisdom faculty. And it means awakened and discerning or uh, just like the prasad is saying, having ready understanding and uh, insight into things. Okay, and so this is how we want to operate all day. And, and so the contrast is the, the unclear mind, and it's called vikshepa, which means um, clouded. But, and it means these things. It means inattention, letting slip, or throwing away, uh, projection, indulging, distraction, moving about to and fro, confusion, uh, neglecting, abusing. I think about this in, as usual, sort of DG theme, 
right? Which is on the mat in your asana, and then throughout the day, as you negotiate um, the, your internal world, sort of what's happening within you uh, going through the day, and then also how you encounter others uh, outside of you during the day. Let's just look at uh, some examples of those three. Okay, so like um, in the asana, in attention. So, so it's very easy to lapse and just stop paying attention to what you're doing. And this clouds the mind or un it, it takes you away from calmness, takes you away from uh, having ready understanding. It's interesting. It's all these different descriptions of how you to how to not be present. So, like projection. So instead of feeling what is there to be felt, we will kind of project outwards uh, onto somebody else or something else, right? So there's a kind of deflection going on, um, or indulging. So we can indulge in in fantasy, we can indulge in actual material, then there's distractions and a, a movement, body movement, mind movement, there's confusion, um, neglecting. Ah, so, so here we have it then. And you want to be able to distinguish between these two states, right? Which is a big job all at, all in itself, which it would seem obvious that you would know when you were serene or, uh, or in a good humor versus when you were neglecting or possibly even slipping over into abuse, right? But, but the mind is tricky. Okay? The mind is very dodgy and uh, like, like this Vic Shepa is describing. It's, uh, we're projecting and indulging and distracting ourselves and um, kind of not squaring on how we're feeling at any given time. And that's where these four uh, things come, come in, these four attitudes to take towards uh, things that arise they, these f the, in your mind. Okay, so this Yoga Sutra um, 133 is so amazing because it gives it breaks it down for you. So, and what it's really saying is that in any given experience that you're going to have, like when you're in an asana, when you're relating to yourself, uh, when you're relating to somebody in the outer world, that there will be the presence of these four things. And they are sukha, dukkha, and punya and apunya. Okay, so they're, they're actually two qualities and they're opposite. And this is what you're, you will find is kind of running through the field of your mind at, at, at any given time as you're going through an experience. So this is how you, you're going to get to the, the way to go from a clouded mind to kind of inattention or neglect or projection to um, seeing clearly, to well-being and to um, serenity. Okay, and so sukha, it means pleasant or comfy um, or um, pleasure and running swiftly. Uh, gentle, virtuous, and spacious. And so, with all of these words, so there's a kind of several words that we have in play in this podcast. I, they're deep study words. Okay? They're, they're like mantras that you, I'm encouraging you to spend a lot of time with and flesh out. And, and this is what I do with these words, is I actually like really go into them and try to understand the kind of full spectrum of what they might mean. Okay, and, and so you have to take your time to, to do that. And sukha is a very um, common word and very uh, big word in, in yoga. Because for one, you've got the classic yoga sutra that the asana is stira and sukha, right? Agreeable, pleasant, and stable, steady. So that's one of the conditions you're going to find in your mind if you just look at what, what's happening to me in Marichyasana D. So there's some sukha is there, some pleasantness. 
And then there's the opposite of sukha, dukkha. So dukkha is disagreeable, unpleasant, misery, sorrow, distress, suffering, uncomfortable, difficulty. Okay, and so you've got these two opposites. And what this sutra is saying is that in every situation, these both are there. And it, it might be in times of great distress or great pain and suffering, then sukha will not be well represented, but it's still there. Okay, and then the, when in times of great happiness and, and joy and ease, there's still going to be some um, aspect of dukkha there, right? So that that is part of being like a, a human being uh, kind of down in this earth uh, and having a body and having an ego and having a kind of slant or a bias. Like an, we're un, imperfect beings. And so it means that every situation is going to have a mixed uh, thing. There's no pure sukha, pure dukkha. It's a kind of mix. And then the the next word is also, it's the word and its opposites. So the next one is punya and apunya. And so that's the word and its opposite. And punya means, so there's sukha and dukkha, and then there's punya and apunya. And Punya is um, holy, pure, sacred, uh, virtue. means virtuous or merito meritorious, uh, auspicious, good, right, moral, um, expedient, practical, convenient, or advantageous, uh, fitting, or favorable. And it's also um, aesthetically pleasing. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful word, punya, right? That, that there's goodness, there's virtue, there's beauty uh, present in whatever we do. Like, so how we, our, our state of mind in an asana, it has a quality of punya. And our state of, our attitude towards ourself as we're doing our various duties throughout the day. And then the what we see in the world outside of us. Uh, so we see uh, virtuous behavior, or goodness, or beauty, and then it's opposite, apunya, which is um, wicked or bad or not lacking virtue, um, intended or capable of harming someone or something. So it's um, extremely unpleasant, disagreeable, irksome. Okay, and so here we have it then. You've got every situation, you've got <clears throat> a mix of this pleasantness, sukha, pleasantness, and dukkha, or distress and pain. And punya, virtue, goodness, right, fitting, versus the, this lack of goodness. It's kind of, there's something not quite right. There's something that doesn't quite fit. You see, because what we, what we will tend to do is to think that yoga or any practice that we want to do, or the kind of the ideal state of mind, that, or what would bring chitta prasad, what would bring clarity of mind is to get rid of suffering, get rid of dukkha, get rid of um, apunya, get rid of whatever lacks virtue, whatever is not good, whatever is unfitting. And, and then, so when we, get, we reach sukha, when we reach pleasantness and agreeableness, and we reach punya, reach virtue and beauty in these things, then the mind clears, right? But this sutra, that's the beauty of it. It's, it's saying, no, no, that, that that is not the reality. Okay, and so what it's telling you is that these four things are going to always be present to a certain degree, in different ratios. So you have to know the attitude to take towards each one, right? Rather than trying to get rid of one and bring one more, you're just going to work on your attitude towards the existence of each of the four. Okay, and so what's the attitude? What are these four attitudes that help you clear your mind when, it's, when you're unclear? Okay, so first of all, the, the positive words, so the sukha and punya, 
So when you're when there's spaciousness and ease, and when there's virtue and goodness and it's suitable or favorable, it's here's the attitudes. Uh, so with sukha, it's called maitri, means friendliness, uh, close contact, union, a kindly feeling of support or approval, goodwill. Okay, so you make friends with the ease. In, in the asana, you, you gravitate towards that. You, you approve of it, like in, in, a, in a very uh, conscious way. Like you're seeking it out. You're, you're seeking close contact with sukha. Like it's, it's on your radar as a gauge or a measure of, or a goal of, or something you're looking for to experience. And the same within yourself when, as you negotiate your duties in the day, trying to find this um, ease and the friendliness towards that. Okay. And, and then um, for punya, the, the attitude is called mudita. It means delight or rejoicing, gladness, right? So when, when you meet in your asana, ah, virtue, this is right. I've, I've aligned my skeleton well along the central axis. I've grounded my femur bone. My legs are deeply grounded. My feet are rooting into the earth. Right? My twist is even along the whole length of my spine. I'm curving the upper spine when I'm working my back bend and adducting my legs. So many things to rejoice about and to be glad that those things are happening. Okay? And then it's also a particular siddhi, that uh, mudita. So that, and siddhi is power. Uh, it's like a magical power. And so this taking the attitude of gladness towards virtue is an actual power. Okay? And I'm going to get into that a little bit in, in, in just a few minutes about why that would constitute a, a magical power. And the, the simple reason is that you would think almost like, duh, like that you would make friends with Sukha and you would be rejoicing when you encounter virtue in yourself and in others. But the very fact that we have so, we spend so much time in a state of a clouded mind, so we, that we fall into inattention, we let things slip, we project, we indulge, we distract ourselves, right? We, we neglect. So all of these are symptoms that we don't take, we don't readily take the attitude of friendship towards um, this sukha or the gladness towards virtue. Okay, so there's, you actually have to work at it and develop a power or a skill uh, to be able to do it. And, and a big part of the skill is recognition. Okay, so we have to be able to recognize. Um, so it's like a layering process. So we recognize the basic thing about is our, is our mind clear or unclear, right? And it's tricky because when you're inattentive, you're not noticing, right? Or when you're neglecting, but somehow you've got to get... Uh, at least around to the point where realizing I'm not attending, I'm not attentive right now, or I'm projecting, and or the opposite that yes, I am seeing clearly right now. I have ready, I am having insight into things. So got to. So we're learning, trying to learn how to recognize what is basic to our mind at any given time. Okay. So then, and then. The, the next layer is the, these states of sukha. Is, am I, is it spacious? Is it agreeable? Me, my posture, my attitude, my feeling, or the way that another person is being? Are they bringing sukha or uh, are they bringing dukkha? Are, or, or are they experiencing sukha or are they experiencing dukkha? Okay, and then... Um, and the same with punya. Is there virtue in this asana? Is there virtue in my mental state at this time? Is the person I'm dealing with or the organization or the work environment, is there virtue there? Or is it lacking in virtue? 
And so then when you encounter suffering and or a lack of virtue, the list of strategies or um, what to do about that is long in both cases. Okay, so in with sukha and punya, so with this ease or agreeableness and moral goodness, it's pretty straight ahead. Okay, you you make friends with it and you rejoice. Okay, then, but with dukkha, when you encounter your suffering, distress, when you're uncomfortable, when it's unpleasant, when it's lacking space, the word is karuna. And so it ha we're going to spend some time with it because it, it really uh, has multiple meanings that are all like, it's like a set of strategies to take towards dukkha. Okay, so, but it means compassion, if you want just one word. So, so you know that, and it's good to come up with one word. So, what's the attitude to, to, towards, takes towards sukha, friendship, right? What's the attitude to take towards virtue, rejoicing? What's the attitude to take towards when I'm suffering or when I, someone else is suffering? Compassion. And then what's the attitude to take towards a lack of virtue? <laughs> That one's tricky, but that one's the tricky one. And I, I don't want to commit to one word at the moment, but th usually they, they say it's indifference. And I don't know if that satisfies it. It's very hard to pin down a lack of virtue to a one word um, attitude to take towards it because it's a complex thing. The, the, the very fact that every situation lacks virtue to some degree is deeply challenging to a human being, okay? Like, we want goodness, right? We want it to be right. We want it to fit. And we build up whole systems around insisting that something is right or being against something that's wrong, right? So the idea that there's, that everything under the sun has a mix a virtue and lack of virtue challenges us to the hilt, okay? But the Yoga Sutra is telling you that if you want to clear your mind, you will come, you will come up with these four attitudes towards these predicaments that are continually arising in your mind as a response to your experience. Okay, so compassion. First of all, I just want to define compassion because it's also a big word of its own, okay? And so if you got this one word that you're gonna to take towards suffering and it's compassion, then here it is. It's a feeling of sorrow or pity excited by the sufferings or misfortunes of others or other like yourself. It's almost like you're seeing yourself from the outside and you, you, you feel sorry. You feel a sense of pity because there's, there's suffering or misfortune um, that your own misfortune, your own suffering, or the suffering of another. Okay, and the word compassion is calm together with pati, to suffer. So it's like literally suffering with another. So, and that another is you. So it can be suffering with yourself, being with your suffering, or being with another person's suffering. So this is big, okay? And another word that's similar, sympathy, affinity between certain things. So a community of feeling, uh, a having a fellow feeling or affected by like feelings. So there's a certain sympathy that you take towards distress, towards your distress, towards your discomfort or towards another person's. Okay, and here's some other words that go with karuna. So merciful. Mercy and, and kindness, tender hearted. Buddha is the one word for karuna, it means awake to, known. So I know that suffering. I know the feeling of distress and I, I'm sympathetic with it. I, I, I'm there with it, with myself or with you. And wise, learned about. Okay, and remember that what we said that you have to learn compassion towards suffering because the, the tendency is to want to reject it. Okay, like I said, the, the tendency is to want to get rid of it. 
Okay, when we're in pain of any kind, just we even like say we strain our muscle a little bit. We are, we want that to be done. Okay, we, we, we have so little patience for our pain, for others' pain. So, so there's a rejecting the suffering, ignoring, blocking, um, doing these things, the, the vikshepa, the clouding things. So this is where the inattention comes from, the letting slip. So we, we don't attend to the suffering. We let it slip. We throw it away. Try to throw it away. Or we project outwards, or we indulge, or we distract ourselves. We neglect it. We abuse it. See, and these are all these responses create more suffering. They keep us clouded. Rather than if we, if we reach this place of being with the suffering, of knowing it or being wise and learned about it, then we can get to serenity, to good humor, to a tranquility, to um, a, a clearness of style, and also to um, having ready understanding and insight into things of like, like why we're suffering or possibly like how we could do something about it, like practical or, or not, or maybe there is nothing practical to do about it. Um, and, but like in an asana is a perfect example. So if, because if we are in pain of any kind, a physical pain or mental pain, and, and our reaction is to neglect, it can even flip over into abuse, right? Well, then that is very problematic, okay? So, so we're trying to reach this kindness, this tenderheartedness, and then come up with a different strategy for being in the pose that's based on attention and good humor. Okay, some other, here's a few other um, aspects to uh, Karuna. And one I love, which is um, what I'm actually getting at, starting to get at here, which is action. Karuna, it means action or holy work. Okay, and so this fits for the circumstances of being in your pose. Like, um, so there's a certain action in the response to suffering, like a different action than the one that brought the suffering, right? So if you overextended your hamstring or something in a forward bend, or you, you went about it in a faulty way, like tipping your pelvis backwards too soon, right? There's so many different ways that we uh, approach a posture. And so we've got to create a new approach. We, so we respond to the suffering, not just with um, being with it, but with action. And, th there's, um, and it's holy work, you see, because a lot of suffering comes from an ego uh, striving. Okay, so we get ambitious in the wrong ways about uh, doing the pose or doing our duties. Um, and, and so, so we, and, and, and what's so interesting about coming from an ego place, it's like um, we're not satisfied or we're not happy with who we are or what our lot is. So we have to try to take kind of what's not ours by force by per se and and yet so the whole but each of us is given this holy work to do which it's right there in your asana it's right there in the way that you relate to yourself throughout the day in your little tasks and it's and it's how you relate to people in the world and so you're also given the equipment to do your holy work so you just coming into the world with your mind and your body and all the uniqueness of you, you're perfectly equipped to do the holy work that you were born to do. Okay, and so it's a matter of, when you're suffering, it's a matter of dropping into that place of what is right for me in this moment and, and seeing that pain, some pain, is just me striving in the wrong direction and needing to pull back and figure out What's the holy work here for me? Okay, and then one last um, idea about um, attitude towards suffering to clear your mind. And it goes with um, this idea of uh, being with your suffering and uh, the idea of suffering with another, which is, that, so the words are mournful or lamenting, plaintive or woeful, and almost like a cry. 
And so there's a certain, uh, and it's called a, a particular tone. Okay, so when you're in distress, like so many amazing songs or paintings or writings or um, physical movements come out of a entering into relationship with suffering um, rather than rejecting, projecting, uh, indulging or distracting, right? And, and so, so there's this, this certain, and I love that they actually have words for it, like that it's mournful in a positive sense. It's um, lamenting is, in this case, it's a positive to lament because, because we, ha we all have these um, limits and uh, failures and weaknesses. And, and, and so it's challenging when we're tight in a back bend or our hips aren't open and we love asanas or, uh, or we struggle in a, the, in a, to be a certain in certain aspects of a relationship and uh, or and people out there they're they're all everyone is suffering so everyone's kind of dealing with a, a limited perspective a limited emotional range a, a limited intellect a limited abilities limited opportunities okay so and so there, we can't always just be rejoicing about it. Can't, it's not always just agreeable and pleasant. No, there's, there's real disappointments and griefs and sadnesses and losses that come our way. And so we've, we've got to square on those things and meet them and with, with this compassion. So that's kind of being with, with action, like finding the holy work. And then also with and part of the action is to turn the the suffering into a song or a dance or a, 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 an oration or something that incorporates it into expression. And uh, it's interesting that one of the words is pathos for um, compassion. And it's... It, it's an interesting. It's it's a theater term, and it partly it means that it's a you're trying to persuade an audience with with pathos, which is an appeal to emotion. Love that, so that you're you're trying. It's a way of convincing an audience of an argument by creating an emotional response. You see, and and so so much of let's say punya of uh, virtue. It, uh, of the idea of rightness. It, it's very left-brained, okay? So it's very unemotional, like um, aligning your posture and working with the proper rotation of your hips or the adduction of your legs. Or These things are very mathematical, right? That And they don't really allow for a lot of emotion. It's just, no, this is how you do it or not. And and, and yet here's a whole kind of attitude that, that's bringing in that, no, you're a, how you feel about what you're doing matters, right? And so, and, and it comes partly that, that, that window into emotion comes from, partly from your suffering, from the, when you're distressed. And, and then you have to let the emotion in of, of your distress as a way of clearing your mind. Okay, now we'll get into the, uh, the hard one. <laughs> which is the, it's called um, upekshanam. So when you meet a lack of virtue, the, you're, the, the word is upekshanam. So remember that lack of virtue, it means um, these things. Wicked, bad, not virtuous, impure, um, intended or capable of harming someone or something. See, this is very big. Intended or capable of harming. And um, so this is you in the asana, you in your attitude towards yourself, and you in your, when you're um, some, somebody else out there. Like what, the, when they, their behavior is, uh, it, it, it's having those, some ratio of virtue, moral goodness, fittingness, and uh, lacking virtue. 
So it, it has this um, possible element of going over into neglect and abuse, just like this um, clear, unclear mind state. And, um, and so and you, there's a range of the lack of virtue. So wicked and bad is really strong, right? Like evil. But then there's an informal aspect to it that that's, um, is helpful, which is that it's um, extremely unpleasant or um, disagreeable or irksome. So irksome, right? So it's like, I mean, it's not like this gross evil of badness. No, it's just really unpleasant or irksome. Okay, and, and so... The, so, so that's part of it. You have to kind of examine the quality of your, uh, this uh, uh, punya. Okay, and here's the word, upekshanam. This is the attitude to take towards it. And I'm going to, it's got several levels or several different strategies in one. And and this is why I told you earlier, it's, it's very hard to pinpoint in one word. But um, so, but it, that first word is like um, indifference and um, almost disregarding. Okay. And so, so this is an interesting response that to ha so, and it's basically, it, it's almost like a safeguard because when we, rec when we encounter the lack of goodness, the, when something's wrong, we immediately want to lash out at it. We want to get, retaliate. We want to get revenge or uh, reject or stand up against and get very emotional. So like anger will come and um, judgment and these things. And so, so the first attitude, though, if you want to clear your mind and have serenity and a ready understanding is this kind of neutrality. Okay, so that you're, you, 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 you're indifferent. You're not pulled into action, into response by the, the feeling that there's a lack of virtue or the reality. And this is in your posture. Okay, it's, it's not aligned or it's going into my lower back rather than my upper back, right? Or I can feel a strain is approaching. I'm going to go too far. Um, so there's a certain um, neutrality, a pure observation of the situation rather than reacting. And this is also towards you, you towards yourself in the midst of doing your duties. So when you spot the lack of virtue, you don't immediately start condemning yourself, judging, um, lashing out, or um, indulging, projecting, right? And, and the same when you encounter the lack of virtue in others. And remember, you're going to encounter it. There's no perfectly virtuous person out there, including you. So, you. so you have got to deal with the lack of virtue in every circumstance if you want to be serene, if you want to have grace and calmness and have your mind be a temple. Okay, And, so, and here's another way of saying it, that um, it's care. When you, so this is different than neutrality, is that you become wary or on guard or protective. Ah, see, now that's a good quality. And you can see why it's hard to put one, just one word on the lack of virtue, because this being on guard is a great response to when you lack virtue to avoid future suffering, right? So, and it's, it's in our weak points that we will tend to slip into a lack of virtue. Right? So it's when we're challenged in an asana that we're, we'll tend to try to fudge or go past our limit or go skip ahead and eliminate a step or two or three because we want to think that we can do that better than we can or something like that. Right? And so, so we have to be on guard. And when we're doing our duties, we're doing our asana, when we're doing our duties, and then when we, another person out there is behaving with a lack of virtue, it's not just indifference. No, we're, we're on guard. We're like, whoa, hold on. Something's not right there. And, and so we go on the alert. And the, um, the word is circumspection. So it's like inspection, but with a circle. So we circle around that thing and look at it and uh, go, wait a minute, 
let's have a look at that from this angle and from this angle and from this angle and from this angle. Okay? So we've got these strategies for meeting the lack of virtue. Okay, and this is another thing that happens that, that we're looking to, this is the attitude we take, is we become unwilling to take a chance or risk. Yes. So when virtue is absent, we do not, that's not the time to take a big risk. Okay, it's to pull back from risk. And remember that risk is this huge element of every action. Okay, so in, in, in practice, you could say it's a, the, the, the practice itself, the vinyasa, the crouch and spring is an exercise in learning how to risk intelligently. Okay, and so, and, and what, so this is it's like when we have a sense of punya, of when it's right or it, it fits, it's suitable, that's when we can go ahead and take a chance and put things in play and make a confident move. But when we sense an absence of virtue, that's when we have to hold back and be leery of risk. And the same when, it, it, when doing our duties and our actions towards ourselves in our day. Do we need this wariness and do we need to pull back from risk and towards others so that we, we won't risk in a relationship if we sense a lack of virtue, right? And notice how we can tend to ignore those signs and then go ahead and risk. And often that's the source of uh, our failures. Okay, and, um, and then, then last, the, the hardest... The hardest um, it, to me is this um, connivance. Okay, so this is the attitude to take. It's, it's one of the strategies. It's a willingness to secretly allow or be involved in wrongdoing. Okay, so that um, Latin, in Latin it means shut the eyes. And, and um, it also means winking. Okay, so to overlook or disregard or deliberately ignore. Okay, and, and so, so the fact that there's a presence that nothing is pure, okay, no person, no, no ideal, no thing, like that anything that's pure in this world is in the spiritual realm that we're attempting to use our imperfect selves to reach. Okay, so we don't mistake that what is really pure. And so, um, it's interesting because... The word apunya, it has, I remember I told you it's got this really harsh connotation of wicked or evil or bad, and then it has a more informal, extremely unpleasant or disagreeable, but then it even goes to playfully mischievous or naughty. And, and, and the street and the slang, um, wicked is excellent, wicked, <laughs> that's a wicked pose you got going, or wonderful or superb. Okay, so there's this kind of winking quality to it that we know that we can't be perfect. And we also know that, that we'll t we can tend to be like get radical and extreme in our need for things to be right or pure and, um, and go way over the top, like with aligning a pose or um, the behavior that we expect upon, of, out of ourselves or other people, and, um, and so there's a certain intolerance and uh, rigidity that comes up around um, needing an excessive amount of virtue and not, and not being in a willingness to like, shut your eyes or wink and um, play with that edge of um, kind of rule breaking, right? That, so it's partly about, being willing to break rules with intelligence and awareness and uh, find the, the, the exception to the rule or what, what actually fits in this, this moment. And, and that's an interesting part of the word virtue that I, I want to um, go, go into a little bit with you. So that punya is a very deep word in itself. Okay, so it doesn't just mean right, like right versus wrong, but it, the, the very word virtue can feel like it has that implication. Okay, but it also just means um, fair or, or even goes further of practical, expedient, convenient, 
advantageous. Okay? And so I have these, uh, what I call the three prongs of virtue, which are that it's morally right and this practical. It has to be or advantageous. It has to fit or suitable. And so something could be like by the book or literally right, but unsuitable or not advantageous. And so then it's, it's lacking virtue. Okay? And, and then the third is this beauty. That there's an there's an aesthetic involved in, in virtue. That it's it's uh, th that rightness means that it fits in the aesthetic pattern of the universe. Okay, and so so we're trying to like negotiate those three prongs of virtue. Like and 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 you're you and winking or um, shutting the eyes to a lack of virtue is part of how you do it. Right. So if something's very um, advantageous or it fits, but it's not technically right. Well, you, sh you, you wink at it. You go, okay, well, right. And that's how we have to be with ourselves and how we negotiate our duties during the day and with others. And so these are the four attitudes to take towards these four states of kind of states of mind that will always be in every situation to go from a clouded mind state to a clear mind state. Okay, so I have two more quick points before uh, I give you the summary. Okay, so uh, I want to go back to this uh, recognition. Okay, so you're, it's like half of the game is recognizing the what is happening in your mind. And like we said, that it's challenging because when you're in a clouded state of mind, it's characterized by neglect and distraction and projection and uh, indulging. So taking yourself off over here out of the present moment and out of awareness uh, and into inattention. But all the same, so that's part of like the fight or the battle or the, the work is to keep returning and examining the contents of your mind. And the, these four uh, states of mind, right? The sukha, the ease, the distress, the dukkha, the virtue, the punya, and the lack of virtue, uh, they're not chosen randomly by the Yoga Sutras. They're, they're very prominent uh, kind of root themes of what you're going to be dwelling on, whether you know it or not. And the very fact that they, these are these four things, partly they're saying you need to have a conscious attitude towards them because you're not easily conscious of them, even though it would seem like you ought to be. Like when you feel uh, ease, you would think you would make friendship with it, that that would just be a natural thing to do. Or when you meet punya or v virtue, that you would rejoice. But this is the thing is that we were so it happens in the asana it happens with in your own kind of self uh, process when you're doing things and then it happens in our, our esteem of others where we don't see we don't recognize sukha in our own asana and we don't recognize when it's virtuous and, and, and in fact we get very caught up in being overly critical um, and too harsh in our assessment of how we're doing, and, and so that we don't make friends with Sukha as readily as you would think we do, okay? And so, um, and I'll just give you an example. Like, I, I had uh, I have my Monday Mysore class, and one student that's been working really hard wrote me and was like, oh, I'm, I'm feeling all this fear. I almost didn't come to class today, and I was thinking about taking a break because I'm feeling, like, overwhelmed, um, and fear of me, of David. And and I, it was funny because to me, I mean, not her fear was not funny, but the idea was like, I thought to me, I think I see her and I see her like working really hard and uh, doing amazing stuff. And, and, but her idea of me, like she asked me to be patient with her in the email. And it's like, I, I, I've, I'm in awe of her. And I told her, I wrote her that too. I was like, that's a, you're projecting that onto yourself because I'm not judging you. I, I'm, I think you're doing amazing. And, um, and yet she couldn't like her. I feel like she is having a hard time just seeing the, 
the the pleasure, like the ease and the or recognizing the virtue, right? And um, and it's something that we all do to ourselves in in the asana in our self process. Um, and then I think that we also we misjudge others too. In um, like I think sometimes we don't. Yeah, we just mistake what is virtuous. And, and then other times there's different cloudings that are going on, like um, if we are envious or, or uh, uh, we're liable to project, like if somebody's acting virtuously or do, showing something ease, some, like a, a quality of agreeableness that it challenges us, like it, it sort of reminds us of our own suffering and then we don't want to look at that. And so, so that's one point is that you're half the battle is just recognizing your virtue and, and then having the appropriate response to it and recognizing sukha. And on the flip side, um, I think it's true of the suffering too, that uh, I th it's often we lash out at someone or judge them or kind of reject them, or are, we do it with ourselves too, um, when because we don't recognize the, the suffering that's going on with their behavior. Like if somebody that's um, misbehaving or um, like not treating you right or just somehow off, like we don't automatically go, wow, that person's suffering. And then the response is to be with that, right? Is this compassion is to suffer with another. Right. And so it takes this recognition. Ah, oh, that is suffering going on. And then not rejecting it or having these um, different reactions that cloud our mind. OK, because the being able to be with others suffering is a huge spiritual principle. It's like to recognize all the suffering that's going on around you and to have a compassionate response rather than a harsh or rejecting or judging or shunning type of response or, or violent or um, aggressive. Okay, so now we'll move on to summarizing the whole thing. Okay, and so in short, we'll, we'll just summarize it. The, so the, the, you've got um, the, the quality of pleasantness, agreeable, comfy, versus uncomfortable distress, pain, suffering. And then you've got this punya, which is a quality of goodness, rightness, um, expedient, useful, advantageous versus lacking in virtue. So wrong, um, inexpedient, impractical, unfitting, and ugly. Okay. And then, and so the attitude to take towards um, ease, and agreeableness is friendship, affinity, approval, um, close contact with. The attitude to take towards suffering is this compassion, being with the suffering, and and then action or holy work, and um, and also lamenting, like transforming or turning it into a, a blues number. Uh, a painting that ex ex evokes pathos, brings an emotional response, or a, an asana that, that has that particular tone to it. Okay, and then when you meet this virtue, when, when the pose is right, when it fits, when it's beautiful, we're glad, we're rejoicing in that uh, moment, celebrating. And then when we get the lack of virtue, we have different strategies. So we, there's a neutrality, a kind of non-reactive uh, equanimity, but and then there's a circumspection where you protect, you become wary, you become unwilling to take a risk, guarded. Um, and then you've got, it goes all the way to this willingness to secretly allow, to shut your eyes to or to uh, Put up with it, disregard it, and it's just simply part of what is happening. <sighs>
Okay, and that and and remember that when you succeed in achieving those four attitudes towards those four states, the, the your so let's look at it. Your quality of attention is transformed. Okay, so and here's the quality, the clouded state. It's it has inattention. It's like letting slip, letting important things slip, throwing away valuable materials, mental, psychic materials. It's projecting things out, indulging, a distraction, moving. So shifting, moving, dodging. It's neglecting, and even can fall into abuse. So that's where you're starting. Okay, and so, and if you notice that you're in one of those, then go to these four things. Look, what is happening in me? Am I, what, what is my attitude towards my, the, the ease that I'm finding in what I'm doing? What's my attitude towards the suffering? What's the attitude towards the virtue or the lack of virtue? And then I can get to this serenity of mine, this grace and calmness and, and kindness and a good, just good humor. I mean, a good humor, a tranquil brightness, and a clearness of style. See, I love that, that prasad, a cleared mind, has to do with this, the style, your own unique way of going about things. And that's well-being, having ready understanding and insight into things. And also prasad, this clearing the mind, is mediation. See, because you have to mediate in order to Figure out, you're a mediator between pleasantness and unpleasantness, between virtue and lack of virtue, and then also between this clouded mind and the clear mind. Okay, and remember, this is applying to your asana work, your efforts and your postures and, and what comes up for you. It's, it's with you going about your, it's your internal attitudes towards yourself as you go about your duties during the day. And then it's how you're responding to others in, when you encounter those qualities in them. All as a way to stay in a good humor, to stay in grace, to be serene. Okay, so there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this installment of the Asana Kitchen podcast. So remember, we've got... Uh, I, this amazing workshop coming up June 27th and 28th uh, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So three hours uh, on the Capo Kids Unite. So really working on uh, backbending principles applied to Kapotasana. And, um, and there will be philosophy that's kind of talking about uh, dealing with the challenging postures. Like, what is, what's that all about? And what's the benefit? And what are the variables there? Okay, and you can do it live or you can do it on your own time. And the two hours will be the asana and one hour will be the, the talk on each day. And the investment is $45. Okay, so all the best. Namaste.